We are in the book of Hebrews chapter 4 today. I had to switch Bibles. Um, I, I don't usually preach with my big pulpit Bible, but my other one kept closing on me. We're so far into the back quarter of the Bible that it kept wanting to shut. And so I don't know what happened between chapter 2 and chapter 3, but that one page must have been just enough to keep flipping it closed. So I've had to switch text today, so I might be a little a little more difficult finding where I'm at, but hopefully we'll be able to, to keep, keep it together. We are in Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to do the chapter. I want to say this. The chapter divisions in Hebrews aren't the best. And I think there might be a reason for it, that being that it is Hebrew thought. And Hebrew thought tends to be a little different than Greek thought. And so it's not as divided as some other ways. It's not as linear as Greek thought. And so in this book, it's almost like there's this one long idea that's being spelled out over and over again. It's layers built one upon the other. And it's not that it doesn't go somewhere. It certainly does. It has direction. But at the same time, it sort of builds one after the other and repeats the same idea and almost cycles in some ways. In a way that even the text that uh, that Scott shared earlier from the, the last part of the book is, is very similar to some of the thoughts and ideas ideas that are shared today in the earlier parts of the book. And even in the first chapters, the first three, those thoughts and ideas are still in the background of what's going on today. Part of the reason is it was written, written as a book, not as chapters. What we do is a little artificial when we tear it apart and break it down into these bite-sized things. This would have been read all at once for the group. And some of us may enjoy that, some of us may not, if I were to do that today. But the ideas sort of cycle one after another in this Jewish sort of way, in this Hebrew approach to thought. And one of the things it does time and time again is point to Jesus as a continuation of God's Old Testament plan. That Jesus is not detached from the Old Testament, but the culmination of it. That the Old Testament systems were a shadow of what was to come and were meant to point to Christ. And so the author continually draws both Old Testament ideas, themes, and scriptures into his description of who Jesus is. The author reminds us that the systems that were established by and through Jesus are better than what came before. And so he urges his Jewish audience to accept Christ as the Messiah, to understand him as God, and to submit to him as Lord. And today's text does all of those things as well. We're going to spend a little bit of time firstly talking about rest. And in the text where he speaks about wet rest, he weaves three big ideas together, or at least three big events. The first thing that he, that he sort of weaves into this conversation that Jewish people would have very much understood the context and, and fullness of is the idea of Sabbath. The idea that God rested after creation as a sign of what was to come for you and for me. That he invited Israel and those who believe and follow him to practice that weekly rest as an acknowledgement of what God did in creation and as, a look, and as a way of looking forward to the rest that is to come. Sabbath announce, announces the end of work. And it's something we're to celebrate. The second idea that it weaves together that Jewish people would have had a deeper understanding of is that Israel entered the rest of the promised land. That that was something that God promised to them. That there would be rest in the promised land. After a life of slavery, after escaping, after hardship, there was this rest that was to come when they conquered and subdued the holy land. Now, in many ways, that wasn't brought to full fulfillment. They got a glimpse of it, but not a fullness to it. But there was this idea that when they entered the promised land, they would find a home, that there would be an end to conflict. And again, this was meant to be a foretaste of the coming kingdom of Christ, that a time was coming where God would rule and there would be rest from conflict that there would be peace, that we would be truly at home. The author takes these ideas and weaves them into our understanding of Christ. Christ. 
And he points to the third big idea, that God has always pointed us to the rest of heaven, to the rest of eternity with God, to the end of sin and struggle in our lives. The author wants us to long for this rest. He says God pointed to these, this rest in all of these things and encourages you and I to look forward to these things. That these foretastes were meant to point to something that's to come and that Christ allows for these to be brought to culmination. That in Christ there can be an end of work and hardship. There can be an end of conflict. There can be an end of sin and struggle. There can be rest. Now Sabbath and Israel were meant to point to the third rest of heaven. They were meant for us to understand what was to come. Just previously to this, there was a warning, and in it the author lets us know that it was sinful and unbelieving hearts that prevented the Israelites from entering into the rest of the promised land of Israel, or the rest that God had promised them. It was sin that kept them from that. And he tells us that if that was true for them, it will be true for us as well. That it is sin that will keep us from the rest that God has promised us. That it's unbelief that will keep us from the rest God has promised. Because God has promised us rest as well. And at times, this world can be difficult. At times, it can be hard. At times, there are struggles. But we're to look forward to the rest that is to come knowing that this life is but a flash and eternity with God is forever. Our struggles here can tie us up, confuse us, and even bring us down at times. And so God points to the rest that was always his intention for humanity, reminds us of what is to come as the promise he has made. We're going to read this big section together. It's, it's a, a longer section, but it is, a, it is fairly straightforward. And then we'll spell out some of the ideas that are presented in this first, first chunk of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 4, we're going to look at verse 1 through 13 first. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it, for we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not want to sh they did want they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day God rested from all his works. And again in the passage above he says, They shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time, this he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given, him re given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him whom we must, to whom we must give account.'" 
This text speaks about a rest that is to come, a rest that was described in the Sabbath, a rest that wasn't accomplished in the taking of the Holy Land, a rest that is still a promise to us. It reminds us that if today we hear his voice, we can still respond to the choice or opportunity to believe and obey. Verse 2 reminds us that faith leads to obedience, that those who believe and obey enter into God's rest. It's been a struggle for the church and for many believers over the years to describe that connection between faith and works, faith and obedience. But this reminds us, this text, that that disobedience is a sign of a lack of faith or belief because an encounter with God leads to obedience. That sin in our lives is a sign of a lack of presence of God, a spot that he hasn't been given lordship of, and that that leads to death. The author reminds us with this word today, a word that he's used throughout the text, that if you're still alive, if you're still here, if it's still today, you still have a choice. There's still an opportunity to believe and obey. In the same way that those who followed Moses had choice, so did the ones who David writes his psalm to, and so do you and I. The promise of the opportunity for rest continues, but it leads through a path of obedience brought about by faith. Right behavior is not enough on its own. Belief and faith in the God who created is required. And he'll speak about that more when he talks about Jesus as priest, why belief and faith in Jesus is required. Verse 12 and 13 picks up that theme from 3 verse 13. Verse 12 and 13 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Like I said, we like dividing this into sections, and so the portion before we list is one of the three warnings. This warning is that sin is deceitful, that it tells us that we can get away with what it calls us or, or asks us to do. Sin speaks to us that there's no consequences to our actions. We've seen the results of what happens when people, even believers, buy into that lie. But God sees all, the text reminds us. There will be a judgment. We will be called to give account for our actions. We'll either be held responsible for them or be able to point to the high priest of Jesus, the sacrifice that was made to forgive the sins of the world. And that's where he's leading in this. But in this text, he reminds us that sin is deceitful, that it lies to us, that it tells us we can get away with it, but that God sees it, that the word of God is active, that it points to things in our lives that need to be fixed. And the reminder, the recourse throughout this first text is that today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. That if God is pointing to sin in your life, do not turn a deaf ear. Do not ignore it. Do not pretend like it's not a big deal. Even if you will get away with it, it will be brought to life, light in the next life. And so why not deal with it here and now? Submit to God, hear his voice, and respond. Confess your sin to the one who can forgive. Repent and choose not to do those things again. Today, if it is still today, and you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. After speaking about rest, the next topic that he's going to pick up on, and it goes from chapter 4 much, much into the future, into the chapters that follow, is to speak about priests. And again, we need to understand a bit of the, the context of it, the Jewish understanding of what's going on. Because he's going to contrast a few things again, weave a few ideas together. The one is human priests and the other is Jesus as our high priest. And in the following chapters, he brings some more ideas in as well. 
But a priest in the Old Testament was the one who brought blood sacrifices to God that provided access to God through the blood of sacrificed animals. And the text reminds us that Jesus now sits with God and provides us access to the Father, that he is our priest. Speak a bit about that some more after we read the text. We're in verse 14, chapter 4, verse 14. We'll read to the end of the chapter. Again, it, it somewhat continues into the next chapter as, as it continues to do. But we're trying to bite off, for time reasons, sections that are reasonable. So verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Again, this text picks up on some themes we've already talked about that the author has already presented. This idea that Jesus is a God-man, that he represents God to us and us to God, and that he's able to do that because he is both God and man. He both understands our suffering, he understands our hurts, he understands the temptation of sin. And yet he's God. He understands holiness. He understands justice. He is righteous. There's this really unique understanding in that not only does he understand temptation, but not as a result of any failure on on his part, he even understands the results of sin. For the sin of mankind fell upon him. He took on the sin of the world and paid the price of death that we deserved. And so, well, it may seem like he doesn't understand when we get in those deep holes of sin. He does. Isaiah 53, 6, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 1 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus even understands the shame and brokenness of sin. He experienced that on the cross. It was undeserved, and yet he chose to take that on, that shame, that punishment, that heaviness. And in that moment, Jesus became both the priest and the sacrifice. He's the one who's able to grant us access to God, to those who choose to believe in him, the right to come into the very throne room of God the Father. The text reminds us of what an amazing and heavy reward that is. That we are to do so boldly, trusting in the sacrifice that Jesus made, the perfect sacrifice. That when we enter the throne room, he is there on our behalf, speaking to God the Father, reminding him of his sacrifice, that he has paid the penalty for the sins that you and I have committed, that we have a right to be there. He gives voice to us. The story of Rabbi is perhaps one that's timely. We tend to downplay the reality of sin in this world and in our lives. We try to bump over it or ignore it. We try to pretend like it's not a big deal. The writer of Hebrews and all his warnings make us uncomfortable because he reminds us time and time again that sin is a big deal. That it is worth paying attention to. That there is forgiveness and grace. That it is liberating and freeing. That it gives us rest. I know there's those out there that will be trapped in a sin of their own making. Perhaps you'll hear and understand from this text that you're struggling and fighting, that you're not experiencing rest and peace in your life, and that the cause or the root of it is sin. God has provided the solution in his son, the high priest, who's the sacrifice and the only one that's able to forgive and to provide rest. Let's turn to him this morning and plead for grace 
and mercy, forgiveness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, that, that verse that resonated with the author has been resonating in my mind this week and this month as well. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Lord, there's hope and warning in that. Lord, if it is still today, there is still opportunity to confess. There is still opportunity to turn to you. There's still opportunity to acknowledge your son, the sacrifice he made, his position as God, high priest, and sacrifice. So Lord, may we boldly enter your presence through the blood of the sacrificed lamb. May we seek forgiveness for our sins. And then... May we experience the peace, grace, and mercy of our God. May we get a glimpse of the rest that is to come. A rest that won't, bring, that won't be brought into fulfillment until, until the time after our death and judgment. That time when we are in heaven. But a rest that we can have a taste of today. God, I pray for those that are fighting and struggling today. Those that are, are hearing from you and are, are pushing back. God, break down their barriers. Open their eyes. Bring true conviction. God, that's not, it's not something a preacher does. That's not something my words will do. It's something your words do, spoken to the hearts of men and women. So Lord, I pray for those that are engaged in sinful behavior in this place, in this congregation, that they would not have freedom from the conviction until they repent. Lord, I know that's not popular to say. I think it's what we need to hear. God, discipline your children that we might be made righteous by the blood of your son and then experience the goodness of you, your presence in fullness. These things that we speak of that, that at their root are revival of your spirit. Let it begin in us. Let it spread to those around us. In your name we pray, amen. Call on the worship team to come lead us again. Why don't you stand as we close? We're gonna do steadfast here again in closing. Stop.
Well, we don't believe that you need a mediator to talk to God other than Jesus himself. You don't need a human to do that for you or an institution to make your prayers heard. It is helpful sometimes to share what God is doing in our lives with one another, especially in the area of sin that speaks the lie of hiding. And so I want to just point to a couple of the elders in the room and leaders that have been proven worthy. And if you have a sin in your life you need someone to share with or speak it to, they are worthy of, uh, of your respect in that way. R Richard uh, is standing right here. He's going to raise his hand. Um, Anna is back here. And uh, Pastor Scott was up front earlier, uh, but for those that don't know, those are three places that are safe to talk. And if there's something today that God has been speaking to you that you need to share with someone, um, there's some places that you can do that. For benediction today, I want to share with you from the book of Romans. And Romans speaks a lot about sin and forgiveness and grace. It speaks these things about being a slave to impurity, to sin, or being a slave to righteousness, to Christ. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you re reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.